Section 10 of Letters of Mrs. Adams, Volume 1, by Charles Francis Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Section 10, The Memoir, Part 4. Mr. Adams was again at home in the month of December, during the sessions of the Congress, which were now continued without intermission. It was upon his departure for the third time that the long and very remarkable letter, bearing date March 2nd, 1776, and continued through several days, was written. A letter composed in the midst of the din of war, and describing hopes and fears in a manner deeply interesting. With this, the description of active scenes in the war terminates. The British force soon afterwards evacuated Boston and Massachusetts, which did not again become the field of military action. The correspondence now changes its character. From containing accounts of stirring events directly under the writer's eye, the letters assume a more private form, and principally relate to the management of the farm and the household. Few of these would be likely to amuse the general reader, yet some are necessary as specimens of a portion of the author's character. Mr. Adams was never a man of large fortune. His profession, which had been a source of emolument, was now entirely taken away from him, and his only dependence for the support of his family was in the careful husbanding of the means in actual possession. It is not giving to his wife too much credit to affirm that by her prudence through the years of the revolution, and indeed during the whole period when the attention of her husband was engrossed by public affairs, she saved him from the mortification in his last days which some of those who have been, like him, elevated to the highest situations in the country, have, for want of such care, not altogether escaped. In the month of November, 1777, Mr. Adams again visited his home, and never afterwards rejoined the Congress, for that body, in his absence, had elected him to perform a duty in a distant land. This was destined to furnish a severe trial to the fortitude of Mrs. Adams. On the 25th of October, she had written a letter to him, it being the anniversary of their wedding day, in which she notices the fact that, out of thirteen years of their married life, three had been passed in a state of separation. Yet in these years the distance between them had never been very great, and the means of communication almost always reasonably speedy and certain. She appears little to have anticipated that in a few short weeks she was to be deprived of even these compensations, and to send her husband to a foreign country overseas covered with the enemy's ships. I very well remember, she says in an earlier letter, when the eastern circuits of the courts, which lasted a month, were thought an age and an absence of three months intolerable. But we are carried from step to step, and from one degree to another, to endure that which, first, we think insupportable. It was in exact accordance with this process that the separations of half a year or more were to be followed by those which lasted many years, and the distance from Boston to Philadelphia or Baltimore was lengthened to Paris and a different quarter of the globe. Upon the reception of the news of his appointment as joint commissioner at the court of France, in the place of Silas Dean, Mr. Adams lost no time in making his arrangements for the voyage, but it was impossible for him to think of risking his wife and children all at once with him in so perilous an enterprise. The frigate Boston, a small and not very good vessel, mounting twenty-eight guns, had been ordered to transport him to his destination. The British fleet, stationed at Newport, perfectly well knew the circumstances under which she was going, and was on the watch to favor the new commissioner 
with a fate similar to that afterwards experienced by Mr. Lawrence. The political attitude of France still remained equivocal. Hence, on every account, it seemed advisable that Mr. Adams should go upon his mission alone. He left the shores of his native town to embark in the frigate in February 1778, accompanied only by his eldest son, John Quincy Adams, then a boy not quite eleven years of age. It is not often that, even upon that boisterous ocean, a voyage combines greater perils of war and of the elements than did this of the Boston. Yet it is by no means unlikely that the lightning which struck the frigate and the winds that nearly sent it to the bottom were effective instruments to deter the enemy from a pursuit which threatened to end in capture. This is not, however, the place to enlarge upon this story. It is alluded to only as connected with the uneasiness experienced by Mrs. Adams, who was left alone to meditate upon the hazard to which her husband was exposed. Her letter, written not long after the sailing of the frigate, distinctly shows her feelings. But we find by it that, to all the causes of anxiety which would naturally have occurred to her mind, there was superadded one growing out of a rumor then in circulation that some British emissary had made an attempt upon the life of Dr. Franklin whilst acting at Paris in the very commission of which her husband had been made a part. This was a kind of apprehension as new as it was distressing, one, too, the vague nature of which tended infinitely to multiply those terrors that had a better foundation in reality. The news of the surrender of General Burgoyne had done more to hasten the desired acknowledgment by France of the independence of the United States than all the efforts which commissioners could have made. Upon his arrival in France, Mr. Adams found the great object of his mission accomplished, and himself consequently left with little or no occupation. He did not wait in Europe to know the further wishes of Congress, but returned home in August 1779. Only a brief enjoyment of his society by his family was the result, inasmuch as in October he was again ordered by Congress to go to Europe and there to wait until Great Britain should manifest an inclination to treat with him and terminate the war. In obedience to these directions, he sailed in November on board of the French frigate Sensible, taking with him upon this occasion his two eldest sons. The day of his embarkation is marked by a letter in the present collection, quite touching in its character. The ordinary occupations of the female sex are necessarily of a kind which must ever prevent it from partaking largely of the action of life. However keenly women may think or feel, there is seldom an occasion when the sphere of their exertions can, with propriety, be extended much beyond the domestic hearth or the social circle. Exactly here are they to be seen most in their glory. Three or four years passed whilst Mrs. Adams was living in the utmost seclusion of country life, during which, on occasion of the increasing vigilance of British cruisers, she very seldom heard from her husband. The material for interesting letters was proportionately small, and yet there was no time when she was more usefully occupied it is impossible to omit all notice of this period, however deficient it may prove in variety. The depreciation of the continental paper money, the difficulties in the way of managing the property of her husband, her own isolation, and the course of public events in distant parts of the country form her constant topics. Only a small number of the letters which discuss them yet enough to show her situation at this period, have been admitted into these volumes. They are remarkable, 
because they displayed the readiness with which she could devote herself to the most opposite duties, and the cheerful manner in which she could accommodate herself to the difficulties of the times. She is a farmer cultivating the land and discussing the weather and the crops, a merchant reporting prices current and the rates of exchange, and directing the making up of invoices, a politician speculating upon the probabilities of peace or war, and a mother writing the most exalted sentiments to her son. All of these pursuits she adopts together, some from choice, the rest from the necessity of the case, and in all she appears equally well. Yet among the letters of this period there will be found two or three which rise in their tone very far above the rest, and which can scarcely fail to awaken the sympathy of the coldest reader. End of section 10